Grannies, not only the Granny Peace Brigade. Somebody said to me, so what, what's the Granny Peace Brigade? Hello, what, what is that? And I said, just imagine a group of women of a <clears throat> certain rather advanced age, some with canes, some with walkers, one in a wheelchair, as I recall, sitting in at the, where, at 42nd Street? That's right, at the recruitment station and saying, take us, not them. Not them. Take us. We've lived our lives. And imagine being a police officer who had to do that arrest, you know? So thank you all for being the fighting grannies that you are, and I want to be like all of you when I grow up. <laughs> and also I want to thank the Peace and Justice team of All Souls. It's, you know, I've, at, at IPS, where I work at the Institute for Policy Studies, we have our, our sort of overarching idea is that we work with an inside-outside strategy. You know, most of our work is outside with social movements. We're in the streets, we're at protests, we're helping people figure out analysis to empower social movements, and that's what changes the world. But a little bit of our work is inside. So we're dealing directly with members of Congress or the administration, you know, when we can get them. It doesn't happen very often. This last few days, I have been way inside. And I gotta say, coming back to a church basement with the grannies is just where I belong. So thank you. Thank you for all of that. Let me start with something very simple. I don't want Iran to have a nuclear weapon. Nor do I want the United States to have a nuclear weapon, let alone 17,000 of them. Now, the big difference is, of course, Iran, as we just heard from Nima, doesn't have a nuclear weapon. The US sort of does. And we are the only one country who ever used a nuclear weapon. So when we talk about the obligations of international law, the obligations of the international community, the obligations of treaties, and we talk a lot in this country, as we've just been hearing, about how Iran is in violation of the MPT. Now, I'll get to that in a minute, but we don't ever hear about our obligations under the NPT. Now looking around the room, this is a Granny's event, I'm seeing most of you were around and conscious when the Non-Proliferation Treaty began. Not everybody, and those of you who were not, I don't want to hear from you. But most of you were. Most of you know kind of what the Non-Proliferation Treaty is all about. But what we always hear about is the non-proliferation side which is about the obligations of the non-nuclear weapons states, right? They can't make nuclear weapons. Good, that's a good thing. That's Article 4, their obligations to never make a nuclear weapon. It's pretty simple. But we never hear about Article 6. That's our obligation. Article 6 goes to the five official nuclear weapons countries that just happen to be the same as the five permanent members of the Security Council. What a coincidence, who could imagine? So it's us and the Brits and the French and the Chinese and the Russians, right? So Article 6 says that we have two obligations. The first is to help the non-nuclear weapon states with nuclear technology so that they can all have access to nuclear technology to use for nuclear power. Now, frankly, I wish that wasn't there. Having nuclear power all around the world, oh my God, talk about really stupid, but that's what the treaty says. But it also says something else. It says that the other obligation of the nuclear weapons powers is to get rid of their own nuclear weapons. So we're not allowed to just have them when everybody else isn't allowed to have them. We're allowed to have them only as long as it takes to get rid of them. Now you ask some US diplomat about that, they will laugh in your face and say, well, that was never taken seriously. We take that seriously. The rest of the world takes that seriously because the rest of the world is looking at this and saying, wait a minute, what's the deal with this? You guys get to have nukes and we don't? What's, where's the fairness? There is no fairness. There's no fairness anyway, but there's especially no fairness if you drop out the obligation to get rid of the ones that we already have. Right? So that's kind of the starting point just in terms of a way of thinking about the idea of an Iranian nuclear weapon that doesn't exist. So put the nuclear weapons aside for a minute and let's look at the region 
that we're talking about. Because these days, you can't really do hotspots one at a time. They're all connected. So you can't talk about Iran without talking about what's happening in Israel, where the pressure's coming from. You can't talk about Syria without talking about Iran. It's kind of become a lot more regional. So the question remains, are we looking at the possibility of a new war against another oil-rich country in the Middle East that does not have nuclear weapons? We've been there before. That was Iraq, an oil-rich country that did not have nuclear weapons. There is the danger that there could be a war against Iran. Now, like Nima, I don't think it's going to happen. But if we say it's really unlikely, it's like, you know, 80 or 90 percent, it's not going to happen. That's a little bit more reassuring than what I was saying a few months ago when I was saying, mm, I think we're at the 70-30 level. I'm at like 90-10 right now. But a 10 percent chance of a war with Iran is way more dangerous than I want to hear about. So we cannot afford to be complacent about this. We cannot afford to say, well, it's probably not going to happen, so we're kind of out of the woods. It probably isn't going to happen. But the minute we stop paying attention, you can be damn sure that it's going to go back to 70-30 or worse. So that's what we have to be thinking about. When we talk about the region, what are we looking at? This is a region that historically had only two countries that had all of the indigenous capacity to be regional powers on their own, to be regional hegemons, if you will. That meant they had size of land and population, that had oil for wealth, and that had water. Only two countries, Iran and Iraq. No other country had all three. Some had two, some had one, some didn't have any. Only Iran and Iraq had two, had all three. And so for decades, you see Iran and Iraq competing with each other, fighting with each other, and you see the U.S. cheering on their fights, wanting the fights to last as long as possible. Why? Because that kills off their young people, it ruins their military capacity, and it strips their economy. What's not to like? So that's what we saw throughout the Iran-Iraq war. The U.S. looks at that and says, ooh, we like this. You know, the two of them fighting each other, that means nobody's going to be challenging us. They look and they say, well, you know what? Iraq is kind of the weaker of these two. We're going to go into that war on Iraq's side. Not because we love Saddam Hussein particularly, but because Iraq is weaker and if we go in, the fighting will last longer. They'll strip more away. And that's exactly what we did. Now, the fact that Saddam Hussein was a brutal dictator, pishtosh, that has nothing to do with nothing. That's the history. Now, we now have Iraq has been destroyed, bombed, occupied, sanctioned, stripped of its wealth, its capacity, its future. It's going to take generations for Iraq to recover. And for a while, there was just Iran, which was suddenly in the U.S crosshairs because it was now the only country with all three of those factors and then suddenly from around the back you had another country coming in that nobody ever took seriously before that was Turkey all of a sudden you have another competitor with Iran another Middle Eastern country that has size and water and no oil or not very much but money because of a very interesting set of economic realities Turkey has suddenly the 17th largest economy in the world. <coughs> Who thought? You know, it used to be called the sick man of, of Europe. Now, all of a sudden, it's in the G20. So you have a very different Middle East right now. But you have some things that have not changed. You have the question of resources and strategic location that are key to the interests of the world in what happens in the Middle East. So in that question, the U.S. looks at the Middle East and has not changed its long-standing policy. So three-part policy, it's like a stool with three legs, right? Oil, Israel, and strategic stability. That was the U.S. interest in the Middle East from the end of the Cold War until today. Now nobody in the White House has ever managed to get control of all three of those things at the same time. There's a lot of contradictions. But the goal 
is all three. And so at different times, different ones come to the fore. It's not, you know, there's times when Israel is right at the centerpiece. At other times, the question of strategic access to bases becomes more important. That all shifts, but the three parts remain the same. So now you have a world where with the economic crisis, stripping the US economy of its capacity, you have the end of the Cold War, so you don't have the kind of political and ideological centrality of the US. And you have more than a decade of the so-called global war on terror that has made the US one of the most hated countries in the world. So you no longer have, to the degree you ever did, it used to exist a little bit, but not that much, you no longer have any kind of moral credibility. What the US has left, that is its one unchallenged arena of power, is the military. And that is a very dangerous moment. Because when your only tool is the military, that's the tool that comes out of the toolbox. You know, and remember the history here. If you look back at the Kosovo War, the US decided it was gonna go to war in Kosovo against Serbia. Except it had a little problem. The UN Security Council wasn't in agreement. And it was clear that they were never gonna get agreement. Russia and China were saying no to a war in Kosovo. So instead of saying, well, we don't have support in the Security Council, which is the only legitimate and legal way you can ever make a war legal, they said, well, we just won't ask the Security Council. We'll ask the NATO High Command instead. Really? Where's that in international law? The answer is it ain't nowhere. It's not part of international law. You can't just do that unless you're the sole superpower in the world who gets to do whatever you want. So they went to NATO and, what a surprise, NATO said, yes, because it's the hammer and the nail. If you're a hammer, everything looks like a nail. If you're NATO, everything looks like it needs military intervention. That's all they know how to do. NATO doesn't do diplomacy. They're not gonna choose and pick among options. They know how to do war. Not always very well, but always very brutally. So when you go and ask NATO, what should we do? What a surprise that they say war. That's the threat that we have right now. When US power is far more limited economically, it's far more limited politically, it's far more limited diplomatically, it's far more limited culturally, it's limited in every arena except for the military. That makes things very dangerous. Because in the Middle East, one of the things that hasn't changed is it's still this incredibly strategic region and it still has a greater concentration of resources than anywhere else in the, in the world. So there's a lot of changes underway. Africa is now exporting more oil to the United States than the Middle East. But as a region, the Middle East is still the greatest concentration of strategic resources anywhere. So if we look at the three things, oil, Israel, and stability, the US is kind of in trouble in all of them. In Iraq, the US lost the war. We were forced to withdraw troops and not leave behind the thousands of troops we wanted to leave behind. And even more crucially, we were forced to leave without maintaining control of the dozens or hundreds of bases we wanted to stay in after withdrawing most troops. We lost. That means that right now, Iraq is signing agreements, oil agreements, with oil companies from all over the place, including the US. It's not like we're being excluded, but we're one of many. We're not anything special. So that was one area. We don't have the basis. We don't have a government that is anti-Iranian the way we hoped. You could argue that the government in Iraq these days is actually more pro-Iranian than it is pro-American, despite the fact that we're still paying the bills. So we got a lot of problems when it comes to oil. When it comes to Israel, the US-Israeli relationship is facing some real challenges, some of them for the first time. The discourse, and this is why when we talk about this stuff, we have to talk about the whole region. The discourse about Iran, and I'll come back in a few minutes to the question of the role of Israel in this escalation, this rhetorical so far, escalation in war terms about Iraq. But in that arena, the US is facing challenges that it never really had to worry about before because the discourse is changing here in the United States. 
When it comes to strategic access, the Arab Spring has challenged the whole question of U.S. reliance on dictators across the region as a way of maintaining its control. It can't do that anymore. It lost Mubarak. It lost dictatorship in, 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 uh, in Tunisia. It's losing in Yemen. It's losing all around the place. Now, the monarchies, they're holding fast. They're holding fast. That's going to be the last one to go. And the U.S. is going to give it up only after a huge fight when they lose. They're not going to give it up. They will be defeated by people in those countries. Saudi Arabia will probably be the last. The struggle in Bahrain continues. The U.S. is determined to hold on to Bahrain's dictatorship, not because they care less about the human rights of Libyans than they do the human rights of of Bahrainis, but because human rights had no more to do with it in Libya than it does in Bahrain. It has everything to do with the Fifth Fleet. That was the problem. The problem was Libya, you know, you could get rid of Libya, it wasn't such a big deal. Ironically, at the time that the U.S. went to war against Libya, Gaddafi was already our guy. Had been for some years. He didn't used to be, before that he was. He kind of flip-flops. He should run for president. <laughs> Here. I mean, but, you know. so. We have this very complicated situation where the U.S. is losing its regional representation. One of the things that that means, look what happens when the U.S. is facing all these new challenges in Afghanistan, which is on the periphery of the Middle East, but sort of part of the broader war arena that we're, that we're discussing. The U.S. has this huge problem with getting supplies into its troops in Afghanistan. For all that we've pulled out the troops from Iraq, there are still almost 100,000 U.S. troops and another 100,000 U.S. mercenaries in Afghanistan today. And another 40,000 U.S.-backed NATO troops from a host of other countries who are there to give political cover to the U.S. My personal favorite at the moment, Austria. They have three soldiers. <laughs> I'm sure those soldiers are doing a very important job. I don't want to demean Austria here, but let's be real. The NATO is not there because they're needed. They're there for political cover. But so what we're facing in Afghanistan, you know, why do you think it costs a million dollars a year? This is a great factoid. Anytime you meet with your member of Congress, just remind them. It costs a million dollars a year to keep one young soldier in Afghanistan. And we've got 98,000 of them there. Now why does it cost that much? It's not going to the soldier. Half the soldiers qualify for food stamps. It's because of what it costs to get stuff into Afghanistan. Gasoline, bombs, bullets, air conditioners, meals ready to eat. God knows what they're sending in there. Stuff in the PX. Now, what happens? Well, there's two ways to look at it. One is you could say, you bring home one soldier and you could hire that ex-soldier and 19 more at good, well-paid, middle-class union jobs for $50,000 a year for that same $1 million. What's going to keep us safer? That's one way to look at it. That's the way I like to look at it. You can look at it from the other side, the logistics. This is all about logistics. So how are we managing to get stuff in when Pakistan doesn't want any part of its relationship with the U.S. anymore? Pakistan says, well, yeah, you can ship your stuff through Pakistan if you want. You're going to pay us $2,500 per truckload, just fees for the road. And the U.S. is saying, what happened to the $500 you were charging us last year? That was then, this is now, is the answer. So what's the U.S. doing? Instead of saying, you know what, maybe this war is really not something we can afford, maybe it really isn't something that's making us safer, maybe we should bring all those troops and all those mercenaries home? No, they're, sorry, they're not saying that. What they're saying is, let's find another route. So they've got the northern route now to bring stuff into Afghanistan. But the problem is, Afghanistan's in the middle of land. It's not on an ocean. Go away. It's landlocked. It means you have to use air, to, air power to fly stuff in. That means it costs a fortune before you ever get to the cost that these countries are going to charge. And the other cost? My personal favorite for the government in the world that is the worst violator of human rights in the world. Anybody want to guess? Uzbekistan. Exactly right. Why? They boil people to death. Yeah. Not commonly, but it happens. 
And that's the government we're now negotiating with to be our partner in Afghanistan. At a press conference in the capital of, Af of Uzbekistan a couple, about a month ago, a member of the traveling press corps asked Secretary of State Hillary Clinton the classic question. Secretary Clinton, can you tell me, do they still boil people alive here? But then he kind of blew it for his own question and added the phrase, or is that just something in the past? And her answer was, that's in the past, we're looking on. We're looking on to the future, next question. I don't know what's with this fly. He's from Uzbekistan, I think. <laughs> so this is a, a serious challenge that, that we're looking at. So that's what we're facing in the, in the region. So where does Iran fit into all of this? So as we heard earlier, the three great things about Iran is they don't have a nuclear weapon, they're not making a nuclear weapon, and they haven't even made the decision about whether to make a nuclear weapon. That's all great. What's different this time around, that's different than the run-up to the war in Iraq, which of course led to that war, is, I mean, there's a lot of differences, but one of the key differences is that this time, those strongest backers of the war are not the ones in power. The neocons that are in the think tanks right now and that are out there in the media and are, you know, they're, they're pushing for war everywhere they can get it, they're not in the White House and they're not in the State Department. However, there are people in the White House and the State Department that are pushing, not nearly as hard as before. The lineup, I have the same in my notes, the lineup of, of Clinton and Panetta and, and Clapper, all of them saying Iran does not have a nuclear weapon. The National Intelligence Estimate, the NIE, that caused such a furor in 2007 when it came out and said, Iran doesn't have a nuclear weapon, it's not making a nuclear weapon, etc. And the Bush administration was so angry at all the intelligence agencies, because that's all 16 of them has to agree on this. Okay, it's you or me here. <laughs> you know? You want to make the speech? Go ahead. Buzz, buzz, buzz. I don't know what's with this guy. Um, what was I talking about? George Bush. I love talking about George Bush. George Bush and flies, what a combination. So, they're saying, look, we're not... Yes. <sighs> Sorry. Was that something important? It's a battery. <laughs> Never mind. Um, George Bush made very clear that he wanted nothing to do with this NIE. But guess what happened? The, the intelligence agencies, such as they are, stayed firm and said, this is our assessment. Our job is to give a true assessment. That's our assessment. Well, 2011 comes around, and they get together again for a collective assessment. Again, it has to be unanimous. All 16 of the, of the flies have to agree on this. And what a surprise, 2011's NIE says exactly the same thing. Once again, there are no nukes. There is no nuclear weapons program. There has been no decision for Iran to make a nuclear weapon. The big difference this time is the role of Israel. Now, there was a lot of talk in the run-up to the war in Iraq about the role Israel was playing in encouraging that war. I never agreed with it. Certainly in Israel, lots of people were very happy when the US was about to invade and overthrow the government of Iraq, as they would be the invasion and overthrow of the government of virtually any Arab country. They're equal opportunity overthrowers, or at least they like the US to be. But Iraq was never their priority. Iran was the priority from the beginning, even at that time. Iraq was an af afterthought. Jeez, it's aggressive little guy. Uh, Iraq was an afterthought, and I mean, uh, uh, yeah, Iraq was an afterthought and remains so. Iran was central then and it's central now. And there's a very important reason. Iran is an important threat to Israel. It is not an existential threat that has anything to do with Iran using a nuclear weapon or anything else. The threat is that Israel could lose its nuclear monopoly. Israel is the only country in the region with a nuclear arsenal. And having that position, being the only country with a nuclear arsenal, gives it enormous power, enormous power, to set the terms for what the region will be like. The even prospect that Iran could have a nuclear weapon 
threatens that. That's the reason that there's this big divide, which is somewhat technical when you talk about it, but is actually really important politically. A big divide between the US and Israel about how to look at Iran. So it's about these red lines. Now, if you stand back just one tiny little baby step, what you realize is this is an outrage that the US or Israel or anybody else sets red lines that have bombs on the other side. That is completely unacceptable. Any red line has to end with more diplomacy, better diplomacy, not weapons. But having said that, we live in a world where too many people in power have access to too many bombs. So looking at what are the different ways that that could occur is very important. So what's the difference in red lines? The US red line is we will not accept a nuclear armed Iran. That's outrageous, how dare they? The one country that's used nuclear weapons, really? But okay, that's their red line. It's up to us to make sure that what's on the other side of the red line is more diplomacy, better diplomacy. Israel's red line is different. Israel's red line is a nuclear capable Iran. Now that's very different. The reason for it is what I just said. It's because a nuclear capable Iran is a direct threat to the possibility that someday Israel may lose its nuclear monopoly. And Bibi Netanyahu is damn well not going to be the Israeli Prime Minister who loses Israel's nuclear monopoly. That's what this is all about. That's what we face. Now, the big problem, aside from the principle of how dare they, when they have between three and four hundred high density nuclear bombs in Demona and more on nuclear powered submarines given to them by Germany. Aside from that, what does it mean to say a nuclear capable Iran? What's the definition of being capable? The reality is if you have some access to uranium and a capacity to build a, a uh, centrifuge, you only need one other thing, a scientist. The instructions are pretty much out there on the internet. That's not so hard. You need a few scientists. And you know the way we used to talk about this was, what are they going to do, kill all the scientists? Yeah. Well, that's not such a joke anymore. Five scientists have been killed. At least four of them were serious actors in Iran's nuclear power uh, programs. The last one, it seems, was a symbolic hit, if you will. This was a very young man. He was in his early 30s, had two young children. He was involved in, in purchasing for the nuclear power program. He wasn't some big shot that could someday play a role in building a nuclear weapon. He was targeted, I think, and I think a lot of people believe, because it was designed to threaten every other nuclear scientist in Iran to say, if even this guy could be killed, you should watch your back. So the threat, the threat, and th this may be partly why the United States reacted with so much anger at that strike and did not react at all to the earlier four strikes. The assumption was the US knew what Israel was doing in going after these scientists. There's no evidence of that, but it's an assumption. But they reacted very differently with the last one because it seems the last one was this kind of symbolic gesture that the US likes to pretend it would never do or never countenance. Hard to know. But this all right now is coming down to the discourse in Israel. Now why? Is Israel pushing so hard on this right now if their own, the Israeli military and intelligence officials are also saying Iran doesn't have a nuclear weapon, doesn't have a nuclear weapons program, and doesn't have a decision made to build a nuclear weapon? Why are they pushing so hard? Well, think about what happens. As long as Israel can claim we face an existential danger, who's really going to talk to them about settlements? Think about it. When was the last time President Obama said the word settlements? It was about a year and a half ago. It corresponds exactly to this period of the Israeli escalation of rhetoric about the threat it faces, allegedly, of existential danger. So there's a great gain, strategically, to Israel to maintain this level of pressure. The question comes back to us. What happens in this country? 
And that's where the issue of the discourse shift becomes so important. Now, what do I mean by the discourse shift? For a long time, the pro-Israeli assumptions in Congress and in the White House kind of matched, pretty much matched public opinion in this country. The success of pro-Israeli forces, Jewish, Christian, all kinds, to influence public opinion, to influence the media, to influence movies, popular culture, the newspapers, books, all those things, was really powerful. It worked. You know, we all grew up, not only those of us who are Jewish, but people of my generation all grew up with all the assumptions about Israel as our best friend in the Middle East, Israel as, as uh, uh, being the only democracy, Israelis are all white, was kind of the assumption. You know, that, you know tell that to the Ethiopian Jews, let alone the, the uh, uh, Turkish and Arab and, and Iranian Jews. But aside from all that, that was kind of the assumption. It doesn't work anymore. The money part of the lobby is still as powerful as ever. But it doesn't any longer match public opinion. Now, what are, what's the evidence of that? The, one of the biggest evidences is in terms of the change in the Jewish community. Look at the election of, la, of the last election of 2008. All the major pro-Israel Jewish organizations told their supporters, don't vote for Barack Obama until the very end. Don't vote for Barack Obama. He's not good enough for Israel. He's not good enough in supporting Israel. Well, what a surprise. 78% of Jewish voters voted for Barack Hussein Obama because those organizations don't represent them. They still have a lot of money. They still have a huge level of influence in Congress because of the money, but they don't bring the votes to the table. That's crucial. You have the books that are coming out. The, the Walt Mearsheimer book on the Israel lobby. I don't happen to like that book very much. I have a lot of disagreements with it, but it doesn't matter. It broke a taboo. It broke the taboo that said you can't talk about that. President Carter's book, Palestine, Peace, Not Apartheid. Also a lot of problems with that book, but who cares? Look at that incredible cover with the picture of the wall and the words Palestine and Apartheid in the same sentence. How amazing is that? That's not only because he helped move the process forward, but the fact that he published it was part of a reflection of that. And then we see the change in the, in the media. The Washington Post, arguably the most pro-Israeli newspaper in the, in the mainstream national press right now. They have a guy who's been there for years, Walter Pincus, one of their really good journalists, who's like an investigative reporter inside Washington stuff. He's never outside the box. He's as mainstream as they come. He's done two major exposés of the cost of US military aid to Israel and how it affects U.S. security, and comes down on the side. Did you get it? Yes. Yes. <laughs> Any of you vegans, I'm sorry, but really. Um, the, where was I? Pinkus. Walter Pincus. It was huge, not only because he wrote them, but because the sky didn't fall. Nothing happened. It was normal, right? It was normal. In the Jewish community, the rise of organizations like Jewish Voice for Peace is now one of the biggest organizations out there. They have like 100,000 members on their, on their support list, on their list of supporters. They have chapters in 30, 35 uh, uh, cities around the country. J Street, for all the limitations of J Street, J Street broke a huge taboo. It was hugely important. All of this is popping up all over the place. And one of the results is the campaign some of you are familiar with, BDS, Boycott, Divestment and Sanctions a global campaign designed to bring nonviolent economic pressure to bear on Israel to end its violations of international law. A great campaign. In the US, it's been a really hard fight to get that campaign moving. Just a few months ago, we had a huge victory, not, in, uh, not a complete victory, but a huge victory when the Methodist Church, the United Methodist Church, voted to boycott goods produced on Israeli settlements. Now, they didn't vote yet on the next one, which is to, bo to divest from uh, companies profiting from occupation. But that'll come too, but this was a huge success. And just this week, another huge success when the, the uh, lending giant, TIA Cref, responding to Morgan Stanley. Morgan Stanley took Caterpillar bulldozers responsible for the destruction of Palestinian homes, bulldozing, bulldozing uh, olive groves, and of course the killing of Rachel Corey. They took Caterpillar bulldozers off their socially responsible investment list 
And in response, TIA Cref divested of $73 million worth of Caterpillar stock. That was pretty great. And for any of you who haven't seen it yet, I have an, a letter today in the New York Times that has all that. That was kind of fun. But this is a huge shift in the discourse that makes it much harder for the U.S. to assume that we can do just anything Israel wants and expect there to be no consequences. So we're in a somewhat different position now. On the other hand, we're in a much more dangerous position vis-a-vis -vis Syria. Remember I said this is all about the whole region? You can't talk about anything without talking about all of it. The region is a mess. And Syria is in crisis. Syria is facing a very severe crisis. There are really three separate wars going on in Syria, and Iran is at the center of two of them. So on the one hand, you have the original challenge of Syrian people rising up against a brutal dictatorship that at times postured as being some anti-imperialist something or other, but was never a reliable anti-imperialist opponent of the U.S. This is a regime that, among other things, accepted the U.S. request that they take people like Maher Arar, a Canadian citizen who the U.S. and Canada had, the, Can the Canadians now admit mistakenly, arrested at, Ken at Kennedy Airport, interrogated for three weeks, and then sent him off to be tortured in Syria for one year of interrogation. Canada has now admitted it was all a mistake and paid him $10 million in compensation. If you ask the U.S., he's still on the no-entry list. When my institution honored him a few years ago at our Human Rights Awards, he had to accept by video from Canada because he still can't enter the United States. That's the nature of this so-called resistance leader or anti-imperialist leader, whatever anybody wants to say about it. Whatever else it is, it isn't that. And this part of the Arab Spring that emerged in Syria, where people rose up against this kind of brutality, has been a huge accomplishment for people in Syria. Then there's a regional war going on in Syria, which is becoming increasingly sectarian. It's not just about dictatorship and national rights within a country. It's a regional crisis, and it's becoming more and more sectarian, where you now have the Sunni powers of particularly Saudi Arabia, Qatar, and the UAE fighting Shia Iran in Syria fighting each other to the last Syrian, essentially. It's a hugely devastating possibility that it could spread to the rest of the region as well. And then there's the international war that's on the verge of being launched in Syria, where you have, among other things, the US and Russia competing with each other, just like the Cold War days, for power and influence and markets in the region. Why is Russia so so much defending the Syrian regime. It doesn't have any particular love for that regime, but it has its only naval base on the Mediterranean on the southern Syrian coast in Tartus. That's, that's Russia's concern, just like the U.S. concern in Bahrain. It has nothing to do with the people of Bahrain. It has everything to do with making sure that the Fifth Fleet can still live in Bahrain. For Russia, it's making sure that their one small base in Tartus can remain. So that's a huge challenge. So we have this dangerous situation where, as we've heard, the sanctions are biting and biting hard. There's political pressure on the regime from within. This is, in Iran, also a very repressive regime. For all the problems and contradictions of the original green movement, the idea that there are popular movements challenging that regime has not stopped with the defeat of that particular iteration of it. That pressure on the regime is not likely to emerge in an anti-nuclear way. The nuclear program in Iran is very popular and there is a popular sector that also wants nuclear weapons. Not least because people look at history and they look at what happened when the U.S. goes after its so-called axis of evil. And they say the axis of evil is Iraq, which doesn't have nuclear weapons. They get invaded and the government overturned. Iran, which was accused of having nuclear weapons, but doesn't. And they get sort of in the crosshairs and they're facing incredible sanctions. And North Korea, which does have a nuclear weapon, hands off that one. Hands off that one. 
What's the lesson if you're sort of thinking about it in really crass terms? You don't want to be invaded? Get yourself a nuke. So not surprisingly, there's a pro-nuclear weapon contingent in Iran. And the government in Iran is not some tight dictatorship that doesn't have to pay any attention to public opinion. They have elections too. They have popular will to take into account, just like our politicians do too. So that's a huge problem. So what would be the consequences if there were to be such a disastrous military strike? You start with the casualties in Iran, which no one ever talks about. No one ever talks about the fact that the only actual report that has been done looking at what would be the likely consequences in Iran of this kind of attack was devastating. Was devastating. Not to mention the rest of the region. Who knows what kind of material would be, re would, would, would be uh, released, what kind of weapons would be used to do the attack. It's, it's, that's devastating. Then there's the question of what would happen to U.S. forces who, would, who might well be targeted. Iran might target Israel. It might target U.S. forces. It's what they call a target-rich environment. If you're looking to target the U.S., the Middle East is where you want to be. You know, we've got troops all over the place. We've got ships all over the place. We've got bases all over the place, except in Iraq. You know, this is not such a... They could do all that before breakfast. They could mine the Strait of Hormuz. They could sink a tanker in the strait and just shut it down. Now, there's reasons why they might not do any of those things. One is that it would also stop their own ability to export oil. Another is they might be more sensible than some other countries and they might actually respond by going to the International Court of Justice rather than immediately responding militarily. But I don't know that I want to necessarily bet on that. So what is the possibility? It comes back to the question of diplomacy. What does diplomacy look like? There's another round of diplomacy scheduled for next month. The problem is the diplomacy isn't being taken very seriously in the US. There's too much political pressure. In Congress, 44 members of the, the, uh, the Senate signed a letter that was essentially aimed at making diplomacy illegal, essentially al not allowing the Obama administration to negotiate even if they wanted to by saying that the only negotiations that would be acceptable would be if, as a, as a precursor to any negotiations, Iran agrees to give up its uh, uh, all nuclear enrichment, all, all enri enrichment of uranium, and agrees to get rid of all its current stockpile of enriched uranium. So they have to concede all of that before negotiations can happen. That's the U.S. goal of negotiations. So why should the U.S. negotiate if it gets that, right? The problem is, for the Iranians, they've got another goal. Their goal isn't just to talk about the question of their nuclear program. They want two things. It's pretty simple, but they want two things. One, they want the ending of sanctions. And the U.S. isn't offering that. The U.S. is saying, well, if you stop all your 20% enrichment, and send that stockpile of 20% stuff out of the country and stop the 3% enrichment at least for a while, maybe two years, then we might start sending you repair parts for your civilian air fleet. Really? That's all? And, and that's, you know, that's, that's their opening offer. So what a surprise, Iran hasn't embraced that and said, ooh, that's a great offer, we'll do that. You know? I mean, it's crazy. So Iran wants the end of sanctions as the result. They're not asking for it as a, as a preliminary thing. They want that as the result. They want that to be on the table. Number two, they want recognition as a regional power that has the right, one, to be a regional power as they are, and two, to have nuclear power capacity as they are guaranteed within the Nonproliferation Treaty. So am I glad that they want to have this huge nuclear power program? Of course not. I hope they close it down. But trying to close it down from outside by force is the opposite of what might ever work. So we hear all this stuff you know, from the, the other candidates, for instance. If I'm president, you're going to have IAEA inspectors back in Iran. Really? What about the ones that are there now? You know, it's, like, it's this inc incredible ignorance 
I'm guessing actually a lot of, I'm guessing maybe even Romney probably thinks there aren't any inspectors in Iran. I'm guessing he probably doesn't even know. Nobody ever bothered to look and tell him because it's not about the truth. It's not about a real threat. It's not about keeping us safe. It's about this kind of political posturing. So that's what we, oh, he wasn't dead. How sick is that? <laughs> I just stunned him. Okay, I need like a fly killer up here. <laughs> Stay away. Uh, this is, and I'm, I'm about to finish so he can have the podium to himself. This is what we're dealing with. We need an entirely new kind of diplomacy. In the immediate, that means we need serious diplomacy that has both sides' interests involved. So it's fine for the U.S. to say we want an end to 20% enrichment. The, the Iranians have made very clear they're willing to give that up and to send the already enriched part out of the country after sanctions end. That's not unreasonable. That's not unreasonable. On the, there, there was an offer in 2003. There was a long-term offer from Iran for this kind of a grand bargain. The U.S. dismissed it without even a glance. We could go back to that. Longer term, we need to be talking about a nuclear weapons-free zone throughout the Middle East. Now, many of you know that's already U.S. policy. This isn't something new and different. When the U.S. was willing to end the first war in the Gulf in 1991, UN Security Council Resolution 687 that was what they called the mother of all resolutions because it went on for 30 pages or whatever. Article 14 of that resolution calls for the creation in Iraq of a zone free of all weapons of mass destruction and the missiles to deliver them. Period, full stop. Not in Iraq, sorry, in the region, in the Middle East. In the Middle East region. And it didn't say only in Iraq. It didn't say except Israel. It said throughout the Middle East. That's U.S. policy. The State Department drafted the damn thing. You ask them about it now and they laugh and say, ah, we knew nobody would take it seriously. Excuse me, I'm taking it seriously. We all need to take that seriously. That's our goal. Our first goal is to get our country in compliance with the Non-Proliferation Treaty. But when we're talking about the question of an overarmed Middle East, a weapons of mass destruction free zone is a pretty good place to start. Thank you. Here's a very important question. As a young Iranian who has recently, six months ago, moved to the U.S. and has been active in the Occupy Wall Street movement, thank you, I'd appreciate it if you could give me your opinion on whom we have to stand in solidarity with, the Iranian government with its anti-imperialist slogans, or people who, take, who came to the streets after the 2009 election, is there a difference? This is a crucial question. It seems to me that here in this country, we have a huge job to do, which is to rein in our government, to stop the possibility of wars, 